This is the Community Forum on AM 1440. It's time for Legally Speaking with the attorneys from the Lansdale Law Firm of Ruben Glickman, Steinberg, and Gifford. Talk live on WNPV by calling 215-855-8211, 215-723-2116, or toll free at 1-800-355-WNPV. Good morning and welcome to Legally Speaking. This is Amy Stern from Ruben Glickman, Steinberg, and Gifford. And today I'm very lucky to be joined by two terrific, interesting guests. Um, the first is Karen Wittes, who is speaking here today about Karen's Law, which she's going to explain more about. But um, it's something having to do with sexually violent predators and trying to prevent them for applying for parole yearly. And Karen will explain more about that in a few minutes. Good morning, Karen. Good morning. Thank you for being here. Thank you so much for having me. We also have with us today Pauline McGibbon, who is a legal advocate with the Women's Center and is also a lethality assessment program coordinator and works out of the Pottstown office of the Women's Center. Good morning, Pauline. Good morning. And thank you for being here also. You're welcome. Pauline has been here before on the show. Some of you might remember she's talked in the past about the Women's Center and her involvement. Um, and she's also going to be speaking about the center as well as her support of Karen's Law and why she feels it's important for all victims of um, violence and abuse. Karen, let's start with you this morning. Um, tell us a little bit about why you're here and what Karen's Law is. Okay, well, basically how the journey of Karen's Law started was with my attack um, that was perpetrated on me when I was a teenager. I was stalked for many years by my ex-boyfriend until he followed through with his ultimate plan to take my life when I was 16 years old. Um, he unexpectedly appeared at my house. Um, this was the way that he would stalk me. He would just kind of unexpectedly appear at my house. He um, would do... Uh, hang up calls sometimes they were morning noon and night it was so bad that my mother actually had to change our phone number he would show up at school and you know follow me home from school so the stalking was really really intense and then finally um he he appeared at my house and he um, wrapped his hands around my neck and he strangled me lifting me up over his head my feet were completely off of the ground he brought me to the floor um until i was unco- and strangled me until i was unconscious um later i regained consciousness and he asked me if i believed in god so we could be in heaven together forever and then he strangled me a second time until i was unconscious that time while unconscious he raped me I woke up halfway through the rape, and then he began punching me in the face. I immediately blacked out again um, because he was hitting me closed fist in my eyes. And um, somehow, I don't know how, but I managed to regain consciousness a third time, and I found myself laying in another bedroom of my house, dressed in completely different clothes. He had removed all of my clothing and put me in a a dress from my closet that I was supposed to wear to a family friend's wedding that weekend. And um, it was just then that I noticed that he raised a 14-inch serrated butcher knife over his head and repeatedly stabbed me in the chest multiple times. Um, He then kissed me on the lips and he told me that he loved me. He told me that he was going to end his life by jumping off of the Tacony Palmyra Bridge. He wrapped me in bed sheets and he shoved me underneath of a bed and left me there to die in a pool of my own blood. I tried multiple times to escape. Um, I actually made it at one point to my bedroom where I called 911. He heard me on the phone with the uh, dispatcher. He ripped the phone out of my hand and he shoved me back into the other bedroom by my face and knocked me completely off of my feet and shoved me back underneath of the bed again and told me to die repeatedly. Um, somehow when the timing was right, I managed to escape and I, um, put my hand over my stab wounds to try to stop the bleeding. And I, um, managed to make it up to my grandparents' house who lived eight houses up the street from me. I staggered in the door. My grandfather, who was a World War II veteran, actually saved my life and he, he worked on me until the paramedics arrived. My blood pressure was 80 over nothing. I had a, st- um, a collapsed lung and stab wounds that were so close to my heart that I needed to be transferred to another hospital because what they first took me to the first hospital they needed to just kind of stabilize me i needed to be transferred to another hospital for emergency exploratory surgery to see if my heart had been stabbed or not it this the um knife literally missed my heart by about an eighth of an inch all the way around yeah and um so from there it um 
my revic- my victimization didn't stop with the actual crime itself. Um, I had a long stay in the hospital. I had to undergo physical therapy to learn how to sit up again, stand again, and walk again. Um, and then from there, I was thrust into the court system as a 16-year-old, not knowing anything about what I was going to be facing. I was clearly suffering from um, very bad PTSD, and um, now I find myself in a courtroom having to face my attacker. I didn't know how it was going to hit me. I was completely traumatized, and I was controlling, or I'm sorry, I was um, sobbing uncontrollably um, in the courtroom, and the judge basically told me, you know, if I don't stop that, he was just going to have to throw my case out for that day. Um, I was trembling, and um, my attacker was constantly leaning back on his chair trying to see me and after I gave my testimony saying what he did to me that day he mouthed the words I love you to me I said I told the judge immediately and the judge told me to just ignore him and then um, his bail was set incredibly low my attacker was actually able to get out on bail and um, we were never notified at that time this was back in 1994 we were never notified at that time that my attacker was released on the streets until my attacker actually violated stay away orders and contacted me himself while out on bail um, he then came up for a uh, trial and he waived his rights to trial and pled guilty and obviously since I'm here and I survived the attack he couldn't be charged with murder he was charged in fact with um, rape and aggravated assault instead so he was sentenced to 15 to 40 years after 15 years he was able to come up for parole and that's how we got to Karen's Law wow that's something um, that's a horrific story And it must have been hard for you. And it must be hard for you every time you retell it. I can't even imagine. Yeah. Thank you for being here today and for talking to us and to our listeners and telling us your story. Um, We are going to go to a break right now. Um, When we get back, we're going to talk more with Karen about Karen's Law and with Pauline from the Women's Center. We'll be right back. From Ruben Glickman, Steinberg, and Gifford. And today I'm joined by two very special guests Karen Widas, who is the supporter of and who the bill Karen's Law is named for, along with Pauline McGimmon, who is a legal advocate for the Montgomery County Women's Center um, in the Pottstown office. Um, once again, our phone numbers here are 215 855 8211, 215 723 2116, and 1 800 355 WNPV. Feel free to call us with any questions or comments that you have regarding our show today. Um, we'll be here until about noon with Karen and Pauline. Karen, before the break, you gave us your heart wrenching story about. Um, the incident that you went through that took place um, that so brutally affected you and, and your life. Um, thank you for that. And hopefully that gives people more of an understanding of why you're here and why you're doing what you're doing. So tell us about Karen's Law. Okay, well... Um Once he was incarcerated, like I said, he was sentenced to 15 to 40 years, um, and after 15 years, he is able to apply for parole. Um, While incarcerated, he contacted contacted me numerous times by writing me letters, calling me, different things like that, even dedicating love songs to me from within prison. Um, They couldn't give him any more time for something like that. It's just the way it is in prison, unfortunately. It seems like the criminals have more rights than than the actual victims. And these are the things I think most people don't think about or realize. Most people think, and, and probably most of our listeners out there just think somebody's convicted of a horrible thing like this. They go away. That's the end of it. But that's not the end, unfortunately. Not at all. And that's what you're here to tell us. Yes. He, he harassed me um, and violated stay away orders numerous times from in prison. So, um, yeah, they don't tack on any more time for that when an inmate violates these stay away orders and attacks their uh, their victims so um, these were things that I had to go through so it wasn't even like he was incarcerated and I could feel safe I was constantly being re-victimized by him within those 15 years so he came up for parole 15 years later and that was in 2009 fortunately he was denied parole and the parole board said that they didn't want to review him again for five more years when he was denied parole did they ask you for a statement at that time yes it, at that time it was impact statements so so the victims could just write an impact statement on how the crime has affected them, and then we send it into the parole board, and they make the decision. 
So um, they um, they denied him parole. They ordered him to serve five more years. Five more years later, he came up, and um, that was 2014. At this point, Allen's law had already passed, and that made it possible for crime victims to actually go and speak before the parole board so they could see that we had a face, they could actually hear our voice, see how it impacted us as people as opposed to pieces of paper. And just so people know, Ellen's law came about as a result of the murder of Ellen Robb. Yep. Um, and th- this was several years ago in Philadelphia. Some of our listeners might remember this this horrible incident that took place. She was killed by her husband um, in their home. Um, her brother... Um, Gary Gregory. Gary Gregory, Ellen's brother, is has um, helped Ellen's law pass. Mm-hmm. And that is allowing victims to testify um, yes. when somebody, when an offender comes up for parole. So that's what yes. Karen's referring to. Yes, and he's a huge supporter of Karen's law as well. He actually spoke at the Karen's law rally last year. And um, so now I was able to actually speak before the parole board and that had such tremendous impact that the parole board ordered my attacker to serve his maximum sentence meaning they didn't want to review him again so he all already served 20 years it meant that he had 20 more years to go i was relieved my family were was relieved that i didn't have to go back and testify and maybe my nightmare could be over for at least 20 more years but unfortunately under current pennsylvania law that is not the fact the fact is that Pennsylvania inmates, no matter what the parole board orders, can come up and apply for parole on their own every single year, regardless of what the parole board so orders. So even though the parole board said, we want him back for 20 years, it doesn't matter. It doesn't he matter. He can reapply every year for parole. Every single year. And all that does is re-traumatizes and re-victimizes the survivors of these egregious crimes. So um, shortly after he was denied in order to serve his maximum sentence, he did just that. He applied for parole on his own, forcing me to have to go back to Harrisburg and testify to the parole board yet again. So it's an ongoing cycle, and it's like the um, the survivors never have a chance to actually breathe in between parole processes. So what Karen's Law does is, is it extends the parole application waiting period for sexually violent predators. Now, this is for sexually violent predators. It's not like if um, you know someone you know has a drug offense or a DUI or something like that. This is for sexually violent predators, and it extends the parole application waiting period from every one year to every three years. So it doesn't take the actual um, rights away from these sexually violent, violent offenders. So, you know, there shouldn't really be too much opposition from either side, but it gives the victims of these egregious crimes some time to breathe in between parole processes. Right, because it must be traumatizing not only to think about the possibility of your offender potentially being released from prison, yes. but also you having to go through and relive the situation and the victimization that you've already you know, that you've tried to put behind you and every having to do year. it every year. Yep. And it's at his beck and call. So if he doesn't want to apply within a year, maybe he might want to apply within two years. So you're constantly on edge waiting for your perpetrator to re-victimize you all over again. Now, my understanding is that State Senator John Sabatina Jr. Um, has put the bill up uh, last year. He's the one who put it up and... Um, today on WNPV's morning program, Daryl Berger spoke with Senator Sabatina, who's the prime sponsor of Karen's Law, and he said that it was introduced again this January after passing in the Senate Judiciary Committee in October with unanimous support. And we are now going to play a part of Daryl's conversation with the senator. I gather that her, her ex-boyfriend served a, a minimum, which was significant, 15 years uh, in prison, but now this parole comes up year after year, and what you're proposing is that it wouldn't be an, an annual thing, right? Correct, correct. For cert, for sexually violent uh, convictions, convictions of sexually violent crimes, my uh, Karen's law proposes that we push it from one year to three years, just to uh, give the victim some sort of break. From a legislative standpoint, this doesn't seem to me like it ought to be a heavy lift. What, what is, and I, I know this was in the previous session, it was, what was the, the legislative progress it made? We, I believe we got it through the Senate and it stalled in the House. Hmm. Uh, oftentimes, uh, bills stall in, in one chamber or the other and uh, uh, it's, you know, it, it's my goal to guide it through the uh, both chambers of the House and on to the governor's desk this year. Um, 
it, it I don't know if it, there was a specific reason for its hold up other than uh, uh, I guess lack of attention or, or lack of uh, information out there but mm-hmm. but we're working on it on a daily basis and we're uh, we're hopeful that we can get it done this month this year it's almost a, an assault on common sense that somebody would have to do this year after year yes yeah it's uh, you know I don't you know, I, a lot of times we are uh, so f- focused on the uh, the uh, criminals' rights, the convicted criminals' rights, that we we miss the big picture. We miss the you know, there's another party involved, and, and they have to uh, be revictimized. So it's you know, I, I think it, this bill focuses on victims' rights as opposed to uh, criminals' rights. I'm sure that you know much more about the legislative process than I do, but would it help to get a, uh, a sponsor in the House and maybe help push this thing through? Yeah, we're working on that. You know, a lot of times there are competing bills, so one will originate in the House and one will originate in the Senate. Yeah. It's kind of a race to see which which complete, you know, which is completed the first. Uh, but, yeah, I'm looking for, uh, you know, some some guidance over in the House. Yeah, I, I, you know, I'm, I don't want to speak for him, but one of our local legislators, Todd Stevens, has been a frequent guest on this, this program. Uh, he is um, a former assistant district attorney in Montgomery County. I, I consider him a, a real pro law enforcement guy, and I, I find it hard to believe that he wouldn't be a, a sponsor of this in the House to help get it through that that process. Yeah, I, I know Todd. I'm, I'm friends with Todd. Actually, yeah. he and I served on a couple of boards together in criminal. Justice. Yeah, it's not a bad idea, actually, to reach out to Todd. Maybe we can uh, pull this one in together. And that was State Senator John Sabatina, Jr., talking about the status right now of Karen's Law and where it is going through um, getting signed by the governor, which hopefully he thinks will happen this year. But, Karen, I wanted to, to ask you, um, the senator had mentioned um, potentially have, get, having people or getting people involved with reaching out to um, other legislatures about this and other senators and representatives. What would you suggest in that regard? Okay, well, currently we are waiting for uh, Chairwoman Lisa Baker's office to consider Karen's law for a vote in the Senate Judiciary Committee. It passed the Senate Judiciary Committee last year um, with unanimous bipartisan support, which was great. So um, we are asking um, your listeners if they could please contact Lisa Baker, who is the chair woman, the majority chairwoman, and ask her to consider Karen's law for a vote in the Senate Judiciary Committee. And I have her number, if that's okay. Sure. Okay, so it's 717-787-7428. Again, that's 717-787-7428. And that's for Chairwoman Lisa, Lisa Baker to take Karen's law uh, onto the floor for the, uh, a vote in the Senate Judiciary Committee. From there, it goes onto the full Senate, and then from there, it goes onto the House, and then from there, it goes to the governor's desk. And hopefully, this time, it will go through with no more holdups. Exactly. <laughs> so, so if anybody out there wants to get involved and help and do anything, one thing you can do is contact Chairwoman Lisa Baker at that number and let her know of your support for Karen's Law. I understand that there's also a rally in Harrisburg coming up later this year. Yes, there's a rally in... Um, the rotunda of the Capitol building in Harrisburg on June 10th at 11 o'clock in the morning. So any listener who wants to come support our efforts, that would be great. Um, any survivors of any crimes or organizations that want to support this bill, we would love to see you there June 10th, 11 o'clock a.m. at the uh, Capitol building in Harrisburg. That's great. Thank you. And if anybody, any of our listeners, if you have any questions, we're on the air still um, with Karen and Pauline until noon. Feel free to give us a call with any of your questions or comments about Karen's Law um, or about victims of uh, domestic abuse, which we're going to discuss in a moment with Pauline. Um, So, Pauline, you know Karen. You've um, been working with her for some time Tell us a little bit, first of all, give us, you know, you've been on the show before, but for our listeners, give a little bit of brief background about what you do. I work for the Women's Center of Montgomery County, which is a nonprofit domestic violence prevention program, and I've been with them for 11 years. And before that, I did work with victims of sexual violence. The Women's Center has offices throughout Montgomery County, mainly in Elkins Park, Pottstown, Colmar, Bryn Mawr, 
Uh, we also have uh, a, an office in Norristown as well as in the Norristown County Courthouse. We have uh, three legal advocacy projects, one at Lansdale Hospital, one at Abington and one at Holy Redeemer. And so we, we, we are out over a wide catchment area. Uh, one of our uh, main uh, goals is to assist victims of, of violence as they go through the process. And it was at an advocacy event that I, I met Karen about a year ago. And she told me about her, her campaign. Right now, it, it, the bill is for uh, uh, offenders who have sexually violent predator uh, convictions. But my view is that once Karen's law is passed, it will be a short step to that same process being applied to all victims of crime. Uh, Because even in other charges for domestic violence, such as strangulation, aggravated assault, those factors would apply, and those victims would still have to come to Harrisburg yearly to testify at the parole board. So it's very important that once Karen's law is passed that we work to extend that to all victims of violence. And why do you feel that having a victim testify um, at the parole board is is so important? Well, it's part of the overall safety planning process that begins the day someone realizes that they are a victim of abuse and sometimes never ends. When when Karen first told me her story, and I've heard her story uh, told a few times, the thing that, that strikes me about it is that When she escaped her abuser, what she did was put in action a safety plan that she had developed with her mother. Just because her mother was a single parent, they lived in the same street as her grandparents. They lived eight doors away. Karen was told, if you ever have a problem, if anything ever happens, you run as fast as you can to your grandparents' house. And that's what she did. She she enacted her safety plan and safety planning is something that's very essential to all victims and that we do help them with safety planning doesn't end the day that an offender is sent to jail in many ways it begins then it just begins a new phase victims are always looking to see when that person might come up for probation and parole and when they can have an input into that uh, process, they absolutely, absolutely should take advantage of it. And one, and there are a couple of ways that that can be done. I mean, they can do it by writing letters to the parole board. They can do it by going to the nearest probation office and uh, doing an on-camera statement. Or they can go to Harrisburg and sit directly opposite three members of the parole board and tell them why exactly they don't think that that offender should be released. And in my experience, that's the most effective method of doing it. But unfortunately... It's a very, very grueling prospect. It's a very, very hard thing to do, to drive to Harrisburg once a year to plead for your safety. It must be terrifying for it's them. It's horrible. It's absolutely horrible. I can say firsthand from my own experiences that it's torture. Yes, and, and it, in my experience, the... The three members of the parole board who meet with the victim, they're always very sympathetic. The victim gets a full hour to tell those three people everything that they want them to know about that offender. And that's very, very useful because then the victim can bring up things weren't told a trial, that couldn't be told a trial maybe for legal reasons, things that got left out, they can they can give a background to that offender that the parole board will never have through the papers that they may or may not have received about that offender. So they paint a picture of this person, what they're capable of, what they've done, what they've done that they didn't get convicted of, and what they could do when they get out. And then that three panel... Uh, are the people who go and meet the offender a little while later. And if they agree that the offender should not get parole, it doesn't need to go to the whole nine members of the parole board. It ends there. So the victim breathes a sigh of relief and comes back to our office and says, what am I going to say next year? Mm. Yeah. 
the last time I was I spoke before the parole board was 2017, and at that time it was only one hearing examiner and one parole board member. So I didn't have the three parole board members that I had the first time because they always change mm-hmm. things. And um, people also need to keep in mind that the parole board constantly changes. So anytime that a victim speaks before a, a parole board, it's not like the same people that you spoke to before who so they already might not know, know you. your situation exactly. So you have to re you know retell it every single time. So it's really important and empowering for victims to go and talk to the parole board. And and as horrible as it must be, it's very important that they do so. We're going to go to our next break here on Legally Speaking. When we come back, we're going to talk more with Karen about Karen's Law and with Pauline McGibbon from the Women's Center. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Legally Speaking. This is Amy Stern from Ruben Glickman, Steinberg, and Gifford. And today I am joined by Karen Wittes. Um, who is here to talk about Karen's Law and Polly McGibbon, a legal advocate for the Montgomery County Women's Center. Um, we have about 20 minutes left on the program, so feel free to give us a call with any questions or comments that you have with regard to uh, our topic today um, or any other legal questions that you might have. Again, our phone numbers are 215-855-8211, 215-723-2116, or you can call us toll-free at 1-800-355-WNPV. Pauline, before the break, we were talking about um, victims testifying before the parole board and the impact that that has. Um, I don't think that people often realize that these victims are often contacted by the offenders from jail, like Karen was saying previously, that her offender has tried to contact her on numerous occasions, has reached out to her while he's incarcerated. Um, Have you seen that in other cases as well? Often. A lot of people believe that once someone is in, in jail, you're safe. That's not true. They can reach out to you from jail. They can have their friends and their family contact you. They can call you. They can, if you have children with them, they can use that uh, contact to, to continue to harass and intimidate you. So there's lots of ways and lots of things that they can do to continue the harassment and the abuse. We do have a, a client right now whose offender is in state prison. And during his uh, incarceration process, which started with his arrest, uh, conviction of a first set of charges and his confinement, and during that year to 18 months, he's managed to send her 26 letters from prison. Mm-hmm. And it's a very, it's a very, very frustrating thing. Uh, luckily, the police have been very good. Uh, they have filed stalking charges against him for 23 of those letters, which uh, those charges will come up for trial in April of this year. And the DA's office has t- taken those charges and uh, is going to hold the offender accountable. But it's just the fact that someone can do that from state prison that really does instill a lot of fear into victims because their view is if they can't stop him from coming after me when he's incarcerated maybe a few hundred miles away, what's going to happen when he gets out? And that's a very, very legitimate fear. Right. So just because someone has been in prison, has served some time and is up for parole doesn't mean that we should look at it as, okay, they served their time, they learned their lesson, let them out. The parole board hopefully takes into consideration um, these types of events, them reaching out from prison, sending letters, and trying to reach the victims. Yes, and when when I work with victims who are going to talk to the parole board, I, I will say to them, Assume nothing. Assume that the parole board knows nothing about this offender and you're going to be the one who educates them. And that's quite a heavy burden for people. You know, they're trying to deal with their recovery. They're trying to get on with their everyday life. And they have this as well coming up. But it works. And whenever the parole board go to talk to an offender, they may have done some programs in prison, they may uh, express remorse, uh, they may seem to be taking steps to rehabilitation. But if they have had a lot of good information coming from other sources, then they can make an assessment as to whether those, those things are sincere or not. And they can, you know, they can 
uh, recommend that they do more programs in in prison. That happens quite often, and that they, they will consider their application at another time. Then it goes back to the victim, and they have to prepare what they're going to say the following year. Mm. It's a heavy burden. And there are other things as well that uh, victims can do to protect themselves. As I say, if an offender reaches out while they're incarcerated, they should report those things to the police. If they have a protection order, uh, then the police can also file contempt charges for violating the protection order, which the victim will then be able to talk to the parole board about again when it comes up for another parole hearing. They can uh, take advantage of a a system called PA7, which is an offender notification process, which allows the victim to be informed as to where that offender is being held, if they're ever moved, if anything happens that, that they should know about, because it's very important to know where you're offender is. And these are all things that the Women's Centre can help victims with um, the getting a PFA or a protection order like you said and finding out about the SAVIN program. Yes, we can, we can help people with both of those things and there's also another program run by the state which we um, help people with called the Address Confidentiality Program because quite often uh, people who've been victimised will move or will want to move and want to try and uh, hide where they've moved to from their abuser. Now, in in modern day, it's very hard to hide yourself. Uh, But this program allows a victim's new address to become confidential so that they can't find it by Googling them or by having them in, uh, involved in court proceedings such as suing them for custody matters or return of property or any of those things because when you do sue somebody, your address usually appears on the papers. But if you're in an address confidentiality program, that can't be done. Again, that's a free program and uh, some people can have that for three years and renew it again at the end of the three years if they're a victim of violence or stalking. That's good to know. I, I didn't even know about that Um, because you're right in this world today it is really easy to find someone yes it is Um, also speaking about protection from abuse orders if someone is released from prison an offender can the victim go and get a pfa and under what circumstances well, they can if, if they've had no contact with the offender for the duration of the uh, of the sentence. That it might be a little bit harder because the rules say that there has to have been recent incidents of abuse or threats of abuse. But if that person is, say, as in your case, Karen, is a sexually violent predator, um, I think a PFA court would look upon that as being part of the safety plan and may well consider it. But quite often, as we've said, people have had contact, if not from the offender, maybe from their family and friends who've reached out to give messages to put pressure on, and that could be used in your application for a protection order. Once you have that protection order, if the offender or people acting on his behalf uh, contact you, then he can, he or she can be held accountable for that. PFS work. Uh, they're a very good at drawing a boundary around somebody and they're a very important part of the safety planning process. And the Women's Centre Advocates also assist uh, victims of abuse, not just sexually violent abuse, but also um, domestic abuse in obtaining a PFA. Yes, and, and we have an office in the courthouse itself in Norristown where you, you have to go to apply for your protection order and we can help people prepare their petitions. We have a contract and, a, and an agreement with legal aid to have our clients represented at PFA court so you get an attorney and on the day of the PFA hearings, legal advocates from the Women's Centre assist in drawing up agreed PFAs which is very important. So if if any of our listeners know anyone who is potentially going through an abusive situation, if you have any friends or family, co-workers um, who's going through something um, th- that you believe is an abusive situation in their own home, um, Pauline, what would you recommend that they do? Well, I would say they should call our hotline, one 800 773 
that can be the, the hardest call ever to make because then you have to put a name to what's happening to you. When you talk to us, everything that you say is 100% confidential. We do not share that information with anyone else. And anything that we do for you will is always free. We never ask for anything in return. And we don't tell people what to do. That's their decision. We just guide them through the process. And when they're ready to move on to the next part of it, we're there to provide the support and resources that they need. But it's very important to make that call. And if you do nothing else, start with your safety plan. That's important. Um, We are going to go to our last break of the show here. Um, And when we come back, we're going to finish up talking some more with Karen about Karen's Law and with Pauline McGibbon from the Women's Center. And we'll be right back. Welcome back to Legally Speaking. This is Amy Stern from Ruben Glickman, Steinberg, and Gifford here in Lansdale. And uh, today I'm joined by Karen Wittas, who is supporting Karen's Law. And is here to talk about that, along with Pauline McGibbon from the Montgomery County Women's Center. Um, We have about 10 minutes left of the program, so if any of our listeners have any questions or comments, feel free to reach us before noon. Again, our numbers are 215-855-8211, 215-723-2116. Or you can call us toll-free at 1-800-355-WNPV. So, Pauline, before the break, we were talking about the Women's Center and PFAs and how those work. And you were saying that the Women's Center has people available in the courthouse to assist in um, helping victims get a PFA uh, when necessary. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about you. You also had mentioned, you know, to people what to do if they're in an abusive situation that the Women's Center has the hotline and people who you can call and, and give get advice from. But how about the person who um, knows someone or has a, a family member or a friend who they believe is in an abusive situation um, and, and won't leave? How do you how do you get them to leave? Can you get them to leave? How do you help them? Well, again, that's that's a that's a very important question, and we can help friends and family members also uh, decide how they can best help someone they know who's being abused. And the most important thing is to listen to them, to keep a an open dialogue. To not be judgmental. And again, you know, there's there's always a lot of victim blaming because the question is, when are you going to leave? Why don't you just leave? And that is that puts all of the responsibility for what's going on in that relationship on the victim instead of where it rests, which is with the abuser. And many victims of domestic violence will say, I can't leave because that's when he'll kill me. And the research shows that in homicides, 75% of those domestic violence homicides, the abuse did not get worse until the victim left or tried to leave. And then the homicide happened. And we see that exactly what happened to Ellen Robb. Exactly what happened. Yes. It's that leaving that triggers the reaction. And so for a lot of victims, it's easier just to stay in place. And when they are being put under pressure from family and friends, why don't you leave? Why do you allow yourself to be treated like that? You need to get out. That puts a lot more pressure on them and makes them feel like they're being very judged. So you can learn ways of of talking to people and helping them develop options. And again, it's all about the safety planning, even for people who choose to stay. So if you know somebody who's going through an abusive situation and they won't call, you can call yourself. Yes, you should. Get you should. Yes. Okay. I just wanted to give, I know there's some um, signs that you could be in an abusive relationship. And I wanted to just talk about those real briefly because we only have a few minutes left. But I think most people think, okay, domestic abuse is physical abuse. And, and abuse is just physical. And I'm, if I'm not being hit, then I'm not being abused. But there are other things. There are other signs. And I just wanted to mention you mention to these to our listeners um, some of the signs are you constantly worry about your partner's moods and change your behavior to deal with them. You feel like you're walking on eggshells. Your partner seems like two different people. You are afraid of your partner's temper. You don't see family or friends to avoid your partner's jealousy or anger. 
Your partner wants to control where you go and what you do. Partner needs to be wants to be needed for money or to control your money. You're constantly accused of having affairs. You are ridiculed, put down, or humiliated. You find yourself doing anything to avoid anger. Your boyfriend or girlfriend is so jealous and bossy that dating is scary. Your partner blames you for all the failures in the relationship. You are accused of being to blame for your partner's pain. Your partner screams at you, throws things, breaks or steals things. So these are non-physically violent signs of being in an abusive situation. Um, do you see these people going through these types of situ- things as well as physical abuse? All the time. And do you think some of these things lead to physical abuse? Yes, they do. And in some controlling relationships, there doesn't have to be physical abuse. It's just the threat of it hanging over a person all of the time is enough to keep them in line and keep them doing what their abuser wants. The whole thing is about control. In my case, my um, my ex-boyfriend never laid a hand on me until the day that he tried to murder me. Did you see some of these signs? Yes. As you were reading, it was just ringing so true. Yes. Um, he was very controlling. He didn't want me to have any other friends but him. Um, yeah. So anytime that he felt threatened in any way, that it wasn't just him and only him in, in his life. And um, yeah, but like I said, there was no physical abuse whatsoever until the day that he tried to murder me and you were only 16 years old yes yes 16 Mm. that's unbelievable i know the women's center also does uh, education in schools um to now to uh inform people of that age young people of abuse and what it is and how to look out for it yeah so the earlier you start the better and when we talk to uh, younger children and even high school students we talk about setting boundaries not just in dating relationships but in all relationships because that's what keeps people uh, protected from abuse from other uh, people and other methods as well and and i think one thing that we really just need to think about here is that this what we're talking about this morning it's not karen's issue and it's not the women's center issue it's everybody's issue because one in three people are affected by some form of abuse so if you aren't that person you know that person so you do have a duty you do have a responsibility to help and to support campaigns like this yeah Right. That's very, very important information. Karen, in our last couple of minutes, um, I wanted you to give some information to our listeners about what they can do, how they can become involved, how they can help. Okay. Well, um, you can reach out to your uh, local senators and ask them to co-sponsor Karen's Law. Or you can, like we said in the beginning of the show, um, contact Chairwoman Lisa Baker's office and ask her to consider Karen's Law for a vote in the Senate Judiciary Committee. Her number is 717-787-7428. If you'd like to learn more about Karen's Law, you can visit us on our Facebook page. It's just facebook.com slash Karen's Law. Or just look us in the search engine and um, we'll come up. But um, the information about the bill is on our Facebook page. And the rally information once again? The rally is going going to be held on June 10th at 11 a.m. at uh, the Capitol in Harrisburg. Great. And Pauline, can you just give the contact information for the Montgomery County Women's Center and the hotline number one more time? Uh, once again, it's 1-800-773-2424. We also have a, a Facebook page which keeps people informed about what's going on, and we can be contacted via email on our website as well. Terrific. Thank you. And thank you both for being here today. Um, We hope that you, our listeners out there, will support Karen's Law. It's very important. Again, it's to um, prevent the sexually violent predators from coming up for parole every single year and for the victims having to go through the process of testifying before the parole board every year. It would stretch it out to every three years, which seems, again, like what Daryl said this morning, common sense. It will also save taxpayer dollars by cutting the number of parole hearings that the state boards have to review, and it will join existing laws that extend the waiting period for parole applications made by specific violent offenders. So we hope you will reach out and support Karen's law. Thank you, Karen, and thank you, Pauline, for joining me today on Legally Speaking. Thank you. Thank you.